Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Aspen Current and Future Direction of Minimally Invasive Sacroiliac Fusion webinar. We're going to wait two minutes to let a few people join on, and then we will begin. And then we will begin. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Aspen Current and Future Direction of Minimally Invasive Sacroiliac Fusion webinar. We're going to wait just a few moments for a few more people to jump on, and then the webinar will begin momentarily. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Aspen webinar, the current and future direction of minimally invasive sacroiliac fusion. We're going to begin in just one minute. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Aspen webinar, current and future direction of minimally invasive sacroiliac fusion. I'm going to give it to Kazra now, and we will begin. Thank you so much for that. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Cass Amir Dalton. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Affairs for American Society of Pain and Neuroscience, and it's my pleasure to kick off tonight's webinar on the future direction and the evidence with sacroiliac joint fusion. With me, I have the man who needs no introduction, the rock star of our specialty, Dr. Tim Deere, and the two of us are going to co-moderate this session tonight. With sacroiliac joint fusion, um, my practice has changed quite a bit. I'm starting to notice a lot more of the sacroiliac joint pain that the patients have because before um, looking at the evidence, before the, the fact that I was able to do these fusions in my practice, I was only doing some injections and physical therapy for the patients. And uh, I wasn't really diagnosing the sacroiliac joint problems as well as I should have. But it, my practice has changed and my physical examination for these types of diagnoses have changed. Tim, how has it worked out for you? Well, Kaz, thank you for, for that uh, uh, really the great uh, insight of what's going on. For me, it's been the same. You know, we actually uh, used to have a very poor algorithm for SI joint disease, right? We would do a little physical therapy, a little non steroidal, do an injection and say, ah, how much we can do for you. So we've came a long way with ablation, now with, with minimally invasive sacral joint fusion. So I think we really are showing here the path for another area of medicine where we can make things less invasive, and we can make things um, more, I think, patient-friendly for recovery, for function, for cost, and for efficacy. And so I think that's what the next hour and 15 minutes will be about, is really a discussion of those issues. And you know, as you, we go along, Kaz, you and I will clarify things. Would you go over the agenda for us before I introduce a few other things? You bet. So uh, tonight, it's not just Tim and I. We actually have a star-studded uh, a uh, group of faculty with us. We're going to kick off the night with Stephen Falowski, a resident neurosurgeon. He's going to talk to us about the evolution of surgical fusion and the evidence within it. We all know that we need more and more evidence for sacroiliac joint fusion, but there is some robust evidence within our peer-reviewed literature as it is, and Stephen's going to make us familiar with that. Then we're going to talk about the biomechanics and surgical techniques with Dawood Syed, uh, Dawood, uh, my dear friend, who's also the president of Aspen at this time, is going to take us through that topic. Jordan Tate and Noman Azim are going to talk to us about patient selection. This is a topic that's incredibly important to all of us, and hopefully we can learn quite a bit from these two physicians as well. And we're going to go into risk and complications and have a fireside chat with Yusuf Josephson and Pankaj Mehta, who've done quite a few sacroiliac joint fusions in their practices and have a lot of experience, and hopefully we can gain some pearls from them as well. At the end, we can come back and have a panel discussion with all the faculty and answer some audience questions, time permitting, Tim. Oh, Kaz, that's great. And I think that I think hopefully everyone on, on the webinar right now enjoys that, uh, that really great lineup. 
Just a few reminders before we start, we will have a DRG-based uh, webinar on June 18th. Uh, I probably once a day, I get a question from someone in the United States or Australia or Europe about some technique related to DRG. So I'll be working with Dr. Chakabarthi on that uh, uh, webinar. Uh, you can see the faculty on the next slide, uh, which I think we have a, a faculty of folks who've all published quite extensively in the area of DRG. Our other webinar, I think this might be the most uh, uh, impactful webinar since the very first one we did with the COVID task force. We had over 2,000 people in the first webinar, and I think we're going to have a similar great uh, turnout for this discussion. Um, obviously, we're in challenging times. Uh, we could hide from these times, but we're going to actually embrace these times. And this is a webinar on race, gender, bias, and pain medicine. We're going to bring it out in the open, have a non-political but very emotional and important discussion. Our, our faculty, you can see on the next slide, is very diverse as is the topics and there. I won't go through the faculty there, but uh, it's going to be moderated by Dr. Strand and, and Dr. Chakravarti and myself. And we're going to cover things like religion, uh, sexual orientation, race, gender, uh, and all those things. And we'll talk about how we can be better to each other. So please put that on your calendar for June 24th. And I really invite you to invite all your friends to that webinar because I think it's going to be a very, very important webinar. It's not about the practice of medicine, but it's about the practice of medicine and life together to come together as a community as Aspen. So I hope you can join us for that. Let me have the next slide, please. I'm gonna give it back to Kaz to introduce our first speaker, and then we'll be coming back shortly. Kaz. Thank you, Tim. So this man needs no introduction. He's done an extensive amount of research in uh, neuromodulation and interventional pain management. Despite the fact that he's a neurosurgeon, he's contributed quite a bit to, to the evidence within our specialty. And um, I've learned so much from him, Stephen. Talk to me about the evidence in surgical SI joint fusion. All right, well, well thank you very much, uh, Kaz, for, for the introduction. Uh, so to, to dive right in, what I'm gonna try to do is, is give an, an introduction, uh, oversight of the, the evidence that's there and the evolution of how SI fusion has come to be and kind of where we are presently in the space with this. Uh, my colleagues throughout this uh, webinar are gonna dive more in depth into things like the biomechanics, uh, the different techniques, the patient selection. So I'd like to just give a little bit of oversight and, and intro uh, to that. I think one of the things that I can probably uh, really uh, try to instill in everyone is that this is not a new disease. This is something that's been obviously uh, been known about and been around for a very long time. The problem is it was highly underdiagnosed and that was for multiple factors and, and reasons. One is, I think it was a missed diagnosis. I think a lot of people would come into clinics, whether it was surgical clinics or interventional pain clinics, with a description of low back pain. And I think without thinking about this pathology, we weren't able to isolate where that pain was coming from and realize that the pain wasn't coming from their lower back. It was coming from the upper buttock region, the area of the SI joint. I think the same thing existed with uh, surgeons who didn't recognize it and sometimes misdiagnosed it as lumbar degenerative disc disease, may have gone on to a fusion or a second fusion, revision surgery, uh, not recognizing this pathology. It's important to realize, I think, that SI joint pathology is usually identified in a pain, pain management uh, hand. Interventional pain physicians are the ones who are most likely going to see this first for a variety of reasons. Um, but then the question is, is uh, in the past was if they actually did diagnose it, did they have a surgeon that they can send it to that would do an intervention? Were they trained in SI fusion and or did they actually believe in SI fusion as uh, a treatment option for this type of pathology? And I think now taking you through this evolution, a lot of this has started to change. And I think the reason a lot of this has started to change is because we're now gonna take it out of the surgeon's hands and put it into interventional pain physician's hands. The people who are identifying it to begin with can now take a patient through an entire treatment algorithm uh, to get them to the point of having SI fusion or SI joint fixation. So the, uh, most commonly these patients present with an isolated pain over the SI joint. Um, so what that means is they usually describe like a very sharp upper buttock pain that comes on uh, usually with different types of motions, rotation, walking, um, some of these patients will actually present with hip bursitis because they've changed the angle or how their, their gait from walking, which can cause a hip bursitis, which then can also make it uh, harder to, to diagnose this. Uh, sometimes patients will report intermittently they can get pain uh, down their posterior portion of their leg. This is usually because there's irritation of the S1 uh, 
uh, nerve root or just referred pain coming from the SI joint down. So this is a very common presentation. Some of the risk factors and the patients you really want to look for this in, uh, the two major ones that people talk about are female and uh, patients with prior lumbar surgery. Now, female can actually be broken up into two categories. Females are more likely to actually have SI joint pain. Uh, some people think it's because of ligament laxity. Um, but then also a separate factor within females is pregnancy, which can stretch your pelvis and also give you that ligament laxity, uh, which can make you more prone to mobility of the SI joint. And perhaps the, probably the most common and the patients who do the best from an SI fusion are those who have had prior lumbar surgery. It's important to remember that when you actually have a lumbar fusion performed or even just a lumbar decompression, you're changing the dynamics of the spine. Um, you know, your spine, each level is supposed to be able to move and to move independently of the other levels. When you fuse a spine, you create a lever arm. So if you imagine your SI joint is the idea of where your pelvis meets your spine and it's supposed to be an immobile joint and now you create a lever arm that's constantly fighting against it, you can imagine how that joint will start to break down. Now, here's the premise behind it. The joint is supposed to be essentially with very little, uh, an immobile joint. It's a joint that's not supposed to move. There is some rotational characteristics to it, but it's essentially supposed to be an immobile joint. It's when pressure is put on this joint, it's when you can have an arthritic breakdown of the joint, you create a lever arm to it and that added pressure, that you get slight micro movements in the joint, which creates an inflammation. It's that inflammation then that causes the pain. This is also why certain movements can exacerbate it, rotational movements or certain movements in your gait. Um, so when you think about it, the premise of doing an SI joint fusion or fixation is to restore it to what it was always meant to be, an immobile joint. So this is much different than the idea of talking about a lumbar fusion, which is, is not about restoring the natural order of things. Every level is supposed to move in the lumbar spine, and we take that away, creating lever arms. The SI joint is supposed to be essentially an immobile joint, and we're restoring it back uh, to that immobile state. Uh, next slide, please. So let me, let me take you through the, the evolution of, of SI fusion over the last 20 years. This all started with a company uh, that came in through a lateral approach. This was only performed, and it's still only performed by surgeons. It is recommended by them to, um, to do a three-graft fixation, as you see here in the picture. Uh, but there are some surgeons who would uh, decrease that to two grafts. Uh, Dal Wood's going to go into the biomechanics of uh, SI fusion and fixation. Uh, but essentially, there were some early studies on the biomechanics that showed that three-point uh, fixation from a lateral approach uh, could be slightly more uh, improved fusion rates than that of uh, a two-point fixation. However, no clinicals were studied were done to look at the outcomes of that. So the main thing to always remember is we don't we know that from a fusion, you know, three points is better than two points, which is better than one point. However, it's always, you know, when is enough enough? You know, do, do you need that added fusion or of the bone to have the same clinical outcome? And that's something that, that is still up for grabs and for us to research. Um, but essentially, this was the first approach that was described. Um, and it was done by surgeons. So you can imagine this is actually a transgluteal approach. So it's coming across uh, your gluteal muscle to come across the joint from a lateral to medial uh, fixation. Now, when this first originated um, and surgeons were learning to do it, patients were actually kept um, non-weight bearing for several weeks after. Uh, so in the early stages, SI joint fusion uh, kind of got a bad reputation as uh, a very morbid procedure because patients would have to be immobile and non-weight bearing after the procedure. Now, even with the lateral approach, this has evolved that patients are weight-bearing immediately after surgery. Um, but you can imagine, though, there's also a significant amount of pain that can come with the transgluteal approach. The risk factors are also different. Any procedure anywhere in your body will always have a risk of infection. And that's going to be true for each one of the procedures and approaches I go through with you. Um, each procedure is always going to have a risk factor for pain. However, specific to this lateral approach with transgluteal, um, was that you could also have a hematoma uh, in the muscle as you approach from lateral to medial. There was always the, the uh, sense that you could have nerve impingement. You are actually heading directly towards the sacral foramen um, or even just uh, cutaneous nerves or nerves within the muscle uh, 
uh, as you're coming through this transgluteal approach. Uh, and there was also some early uh, evidence and publications that showed that uh, by being non-weight bearing or becoming weight bearing too early, you could actually change your gait and develop hip bursitis as an adverse event of this procedure. Now, the lateral approach did evolve now over the uh, the last 10 years. Surgeons have gotten better at it. The introducer sets uh, and tools uh, have improved uh, significantly. And like I said, now patients are full weight bearing following the procedure, but essentially everything started with the lateral approach with surgeons. Next slide, please. Now, about 10 years ago, the surgeons started developing posterior or what we call posterior oblique approaches. Um, here's an example of a two screw two titanium screw fixation via a posterior oblique approach. So what a posterior oblique approach is, is rather than being lateral or what we would call directly posterior, which means directly up, uh, above the joint, you're actually just slightly lateral to being above the joint. So if you can picture where the joint is, if you were supposed to come down perpendicular on it, you would come in about three centimeters, four centimeters lateral to that and come in at a slight angle uh, to enter the joint. That's what we consider a posterior oblique approach. Uh, this was one of the most common ones used. Uh, this was a Medtronic Rialto system that the surgeons used. Uh, something I actually became very familiar with uh, in my training and after I came out of training. Now, some of the advances or, or advantages to uh, using this approach was uh, it was less morbid. You didn't actually have to come across muscle. You would only go through skin, subcutaneous tissue, or fat and be directly on the joint at that point or just on the lateral aspect of the joint. So you wouldn't actually have to dissect uh, muscle tissue for it. So now you, you limited the idea of non-weight bearing. You limited the idea of the pain that comes with a transgluteal approach. Um, however, you also still had the risk factor of uh, heading towards the S1 nerve root or the sacral foramen. Uh, and what you can actually see here on these images, uh, near the tips of the screws, maybe just a half centimeter away, is your sacral foramen. So we had surgeons had to be very cautious about the depth of these screws, and these screws needed to be measured. Uh, so we would put in initial uh, uh, dilators or devices to measure the length of the screw first before introducing the final screw to make sure we didn't enter uh, the sacral foramen. Uh, there was some evidence that came out with this that showed that it could have less adverse events, it could be less morbid of a procedure, and it was actually slightly faster than doing the lateral approaches, as you can imagine, because there was less floral time, less exposure. Uh, next slide. And then now let's move on to the, the, the present day. Uh, we now moved into direct posterior approaches with, with actual graft fixation. So rather now than talking about uh, titanium screw fixation or the graft going across the joint as we had with the lateral approach, we moved on to actually placing grafts inside the joint. Now, you can imagine th these grafts then need to do two things if they're going to replace these surgical approaches. The first is they have, to, they have to have immediate fixation. The idea that you just, we're not waiting for a fusion to happen. A fusion can happen on the bony fusion anywhere from six months to 18 months um, if it's going to happen. Uh, so that would mean that when you do these procedures, patients wouldn't have relief for six, the first six months. So these graft fixations also have to produce an element of immobility in the joint. Uh, this was done by different approaches, whether it was by converging the grafts or by the shape of the graft that as, you, as it's placed into uh, the, the SI space there, um, the joint, uh, that the, 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 the uh, shape of the graft would prevent the mobility or rotation around it. Um, this is now early work and research is now coming out on this, but as you can imagine now, this is now starting to take the, the advantages of the surgical posterior or posterior oblique approach, and now potentially putting it in the hands of interventional pain physicians. So next slide. So just to, to talk a little bit about the evidence of this before we move on to our next sections. Presently on the market, there is more than 25 X SI fusion device companies, all doing it through different approaches, whether it's through lateral, whether it's through posterior, posterior, oblique, some companies offer multiple approaches with their devices. Now, the early data all revolved around that lateral approach we talked about with the surgical company, where they introduced two multi-center randomized control trials, so level one evidence, comparing it against conventional medical management, and it was far superior to it. They approached uh, success rates of over 80%, demonstrating 88% fusion rates, but clinical success rates of pain relief around the 80%. 
And obviously, if you do that, quality of life and pain score uh, improve for those. So this is where all the early data revolved around it. This company actually uh, basically put, gave us the path forward for all these other companies to come out and use their devices via different approaches. However, the multi-center randomized control trials have not been performed by any other approach uh, or other companies. The posterior approach, and a lot of the companies got gained approval off of using the data from the lateral approach or the SI bone company. So most of the data we have now from the posterior approach, whether by titanium screws or by graft uh, or an inner body fixation, is through retro, uh, retrospective studies, as well as some prospective case series. It's these prospective case series that were presented to the FDA to gain the approval. Uh, so next slide. So uh, I just wanted to touch base on this last one before we move on. Now, the evidence has shown that the adverse event ratio, regardless of whatever approach you use, is very low. The highest uh, adverse uh, event rate we have is usually for infection, which is about 4% previously quoted. But we do know now with some of the new approaches that has actually begun to decrease. So you can imagine the adverse event profile for all those adverse I, events I spoke about is very low. This was a study uh, spearheaded with some of the, our colleagues here, including Don Wood, looking at uh, inner body or graft fixation via posterior approach, multi-center, uh, retrospective study. And what it actually showed is they could start mirroring the rates of 70 to 80% success rates, uh, which, was, which was fantastic because we've never actually shown a larger study uh, with these other approaches. Um, but what it also did show, interestingly enough, was they looked at different risk factors, female, uh, as well as lumbar fusion, and they showed that the patients with prior lumbar fusion actually did the best uh, with these approaches and these uh, interventions, which shows you that even surgeons have highly underdiagnosed uh, this pathology and this problem. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so this is where I'm going to end up passing it to my colleagues, uh, but I'll ask Tim and Kaz, is there any questions you have at this point? Yeah, I have, I'm going to ask Stephen, I'm going to ask you one quick question, and then we're going to go into Dawood with uh, Kaz introducing him. The question is this, uh, you know, we have always talked about uh, doing intraarticular injections as a diagnostic block with local anesthetic and arthrograms to define the anatomy. Uh, and just very quickly, what's the what's the predictive value of a diagnostic S adjoint injection with local or an arthrogram? Um, well, I will say that uh, as a surgeon who has performed this procedure, uh, doing the surgical approaches first, and now moving on to these minimally invasive inner body. Uh, uh, or graph fixation approaches. The one criteria we've always looked for, besides the physical exam features and maneuvers, uh, was a response to a, a diagnostic injection. So whether you decide to do a diagnostic or therapeutic injection, we wanted to see that there was a response to that. Uh, we didn't necessarily need more than that. Some of the insurance companies do require a response to two diagnostic injections. Uh, and they usually look for, if it's a diagnostic injection, 70% uh, improvement with each one that lasts at least 24 hours. Great, thank you very much, Stephen, that was awesome. Kaz? Thank you so much, Stephen. Please stand by, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of people are gonna have a lot of questions for you at the end. So now we're moving on to Professor Syed. Dawood and I have been friends now for quite a few years. He started to do research in his fellowship and he's continued to do a lot of work and his name is on a lot of different papers uh, and manuscripts out there. And he's been not only bringing a lot of evidence to our space, but he's trained a lot of fellows and physicians as well. In fact, I learned how to do a sacred electro infusion from Dawood himself. Uh, so I'm really interested to learn about the biomechanics and the surgical techniques as well. Dawood, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kaz. Uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Pain Tech, for uh, sponsoring this webinar today. Uh, and Stephen uh, really set the stage nicely for my uh, next 10 minutes or so. So what I'm going to be talking about are the biomechanical implications of sacroiliac fusion. So I think now that, you know, pain physicians uh, have this tool widely available for them, I think we really need to take a step back and really understand what we're doing to this joint. Uh, I think Stephen made a lot of excellent points, you know where when we think about fusion in the lumbar spine, sometimes that's not necessarily a good thing. But in the sacroiliac joint, fusion can be a very positive thing because the way it was naturally constructed was to be immobile. So I'm gonna talk about some of the you know, complex rotational motions of the SI joint and what those implications are in fusion, then go very briefly over the surgical technique. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
So again, like I mentioned, the sacroiliac joint um, has been studied for uh, many years. Um, and really a lot of the study, when you look at um, studies in uh, basic anatomy and physical therapy um, literature, really look at what are the ranges of motions and which, which ways and axes does the SI joint move in. So there's really three main axes that the SI joint moves in. Probably the most um, um, common or most uh, the joint, the motion that really makes the biggest difference is nutation. So that's motion of the sacrum in relation to the rest of the pelvis and hips. So that's a kind of a forward motion uh, or a flexion type motion. So that really is a motion that happens most at the lumbosacral pivot point, which is around the S2 foramen or the midpoint of the joint. Next slide, please. So again, uh, when we talk about the SI joint, uh, one way I like to describe the SI joint is in segments. So you talk about the upper part of the SI joint as the S1 segment, the middle part of the, uh, the joint, which is the largest part, uh, most, uh, most commonly is, is referred to as the S2 part of the joint. And then the most inferior part portion of the joint where we commonly access for a lot of our, our intraarticular joint injections is referred to as the S3 segment. So again, when you look at some of the various um, research that's been done, where is most of the motion? So again, most of the motion and rotation of the sacrum uh, is accountable from mutation and counter mutation around that transverse axis at the S2 region. So for me, myself, when I was looking at, you know, as Stephen mentioned, you know, 35 different systems there and many now posterior and designed for interventional pain positions, I really was looking for a system that really address the problem where I see where most of the motion occurs. And for a lot of these patients, the motion and the pathological motion happens at the mid portion of that joint at the S2 level. Next slide. So the biomechanical studies, I just put this slide here just to show how complex it is to really measure motion uh, in the sacroiliac joint for biomechanical studies. Uh, actually, Dr. Falowski and myself are now involved in a biomechanical study looking at uh, a posterior fixation uh, fusion technique. Uh, and I can tell you it's very complex. They have to put many sensors in different places on the pelvis using infrared sensors to f find even just millimeters of range of motion changes when you perform a fusion. So again, when we talk about what kind of ranges of motions and axes they measure, they're typically looking at flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. Next slide, please. So this is an interesting study that was done. And again, as Stephen said, SI Bone has, has produced most of the literature in the space right now. This was one of their biomechanical studies. And I just put it here just to show you why I think, you know, to achieve fusion and stabilize the joint, it doesn't take a lot because there's really not a lot of motion there. So if you look at this, they looked at you know the three most common um, ranges of motions or axes of rotation, which talk about flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. The blue mark shows the range, natural range of motion in an intact cadaver. Um, what they found is that they had to sacrifice the posterior segments to create um, a pathological state. And you can see when they create that pathological state in the SI joint, you see a significant increase in the range of motion. What they did in this uh, study was then place three large screws from a lateral, a lateral approach to create a fusion or stabilization of a joint. And what you can see is that the greatest change happens in that flexion extension. But again, we're only talking about a few millimeters of improvement. Uh, you look at the changes that happen in lateral bending and axial rotation, they're very minimal, even when the posterior ligaments are completely sacrificed, which even in a very diseased state is probably not going to happen in a human being. So again, I think SI fusion or SI bone did work, does work very well, but perhaps it's overkill. That's why these more ultra minimally invasive approaches may be equally as efficacious in many ways, even superior, because it does not take a lot to create this uh, stabilization of the joint. Next slide, please. So uh, when we talk about uh, SI fusion and stabilization, we also have to talk about arthrodesis. This is really a concept that's very common uh, and very well known by our orthopedic colleagues and neurosurgical colleagues. But for most of us that are interventional pain physicians, physiatrists, and anesthesiologists, we really don't understand arthrodesis very well. So what arthrodesis is, is defined as the art 
artificial induction of joint ossification between two bones by surgery. And if you go back to medical school, uh, the three principles of bone grafting include osteoconduction, osteoinduction, and osteogenesis. And osteogenesis has the highest fusion potential. But there are other implications that we must think about from a clinical standpoint. When we think about achieving arthrodesis in our patients, we have to take into account the patient's bone density. You know, our surgical colleagues really look at tobaccoism. All of these things can affect the ability for the joint to fuse. Um, drill or no drill. Uh, I think all of us think, um, you know, using a power tool that are not surgeons, it's very cool. Um, it makes us feel uh, like we're really doing something. But I think there's also some things we need to think about when you do use a drill. Are we actually inhibiting the, uh, the ability for arthrodesis to occur? So a lot of the orthopedic literature has looked at bone drilling uh, when trying to achieve fusion. And you can increase the temperature above 47 degrees centigrade with even short times of cortical bone drilling. And that can also cause uh, a reduced regenerative capacity and osteonecrosis. So again, if you want arthrodesis to occur there, perhaps drilling is not the way to go. Again, the data, uh, this will have to be studied further, but is again, something to think about when you're looking at all these different systems and techniques. Next slide. So another thing I think is really important when we think about the biomechanics is now that we're most of us uh, in the audience are moving towards using allografts in a posterior approach is looking at the graft window. Uh, I, I show three of the co most common uh, grafts used on the market right now in our space. And again, what the graft window means is, you know, the space within the graft itself, which arthrodesis can occur around. So again, you can see the different variation in size and graft windows between uh, many of these different types of products on the market. Um, with some of the you know literature and uh, data we, we, we've derived from the lumbar spine um, space, we know that a larger graft window typically leads to higher rates of arthrodesis infusion. Next slide. Here's, uh, I'm just gonna pivot now out of biomechanics and we'll talk a little bit about just the surgical technique. Uh, this is the typical instrumentation for uh, one of the platforms out there that we'll be talking about our sponsor, uh, Pain Tech. So again, a lot of these instrumentation look uh, very similar amongst the companies. I do really uh, like this. It's a very streamlined approach. Again, what you'll have is you'll have a tissue dilator, which is um, uh, that blue instrument at the top. Um, and then the, the device right below it is the working cannula. So with this platform, actually the tissue dilator and the cannula are all uh, done in one step. The, 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 the device in the middle um, is the decortication um, device where you do to decorticate the joint prior to in placing the implant. And then the, the, the green device uh, at the bottom is the uh, graft inserter. Uh, what you also have at the bottom are the Steinman pins that are used to access the joint. Next slide, please. So again, I'll just walk through some of the steps from a case I had done a couple of weeks ago. So again, this is the surgical technique for the posterior single point, uh, single point S2 technique. So again, as with many of the procedures uh, that we do in our space, the most important and vital step of this is the first step. And that's putting that Steinman pin into the SI joint. Again, for those of us that do sacroiliac joint injections, we know that getting precisely in the joint can be a challenge. So again, with this, you can't really fudge that step. You have to make sure you are in the joint. You don't want to have, a, have the Steinman pin going too medial into the sacrum or too lateral into the ilium. So again, here you see that first step uh, where the Steinman pin has accessed the joint. Then you confirm in the lateral to see that you are within the area of the sacroiliac joint. Your safety margin is that sacrum. Again, you can uh, you try to not go anterior to that, but keep in mind that the sacroiliac joint will go anterior past the sacrum, but you know you'll never get into trouble if you stay posterior to that anterior margin uh, of the sacrum. Next slide. What we have here is a fluoroscopic lateral image of the tissue dilator and the working cannula being advanced into the SI joint. Uh, the image to the right is what I call um, the money shot. So again, what you'll do is you'll you'll bring your C arm back to an oblique view, and if you can see right down that working cannula, you can see the line of the SI joint. You know you're right where you need to be. So again, you see a really nice view of that sacroiliac joint down that working cannula. Next slide. 
Uh, this uh, image on the left is then the decortication. Again, you place the decortication uh, device within to the sacroiliac joint to uh, cause a bleeding service uh, and create the prime environment. In, in this technique, we do not use any drill. Uh, and then after you take the decortication device out, you'll place your graft implant. Uh, the graft implant is also coated in DBM putty. So again, that's something that also enhances the ability of fusion. Uh, next slide. And then these are final x-ray images. They're subtle, it's hard to see at times, but again, you can see the uh, implant uh, in the lateral projection, and then you come back to your oblique view and you can see the implant uh, right within the sacroiliac joint. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to just share a, a patient story or a patient video of mine. One thing that was really kind of pronounced to me is that when I first started to do this, I've done now about 50 plus cases, is that I anticipated that patients really would not achieve meaningful improvement in function and pain for several weeks to months, because I thought fusion would take some time to occur. But a lot of my patients would come back at their one week, and still to this point, I would say 75% of my patients come back at their first post-op visit with significant reduction in their pain. So I think there's really two mechanisms of action here when you place a, a graft in the posterior. There's stabilization and there's fusion. The stabilization part of this procedure happens almost immediately when you put the graft in that right position. Uh, if the video does come out right, I'll show you uh, some gait um, uh, videos that I have of a patient. So on the left, what you'll see here is a patient prior to placing the implant. You can see that he has uh, really chronic uh, post uh, laminectomy pain and sacroiliitis uh, that really affected his ability to walk. So you can really notice this hitch in his step. But the video, you may have to play it a second time to really get it to and he has given us consent. This is my longtime patient, Gary. Can we play that one on the left one more time? Let's see if we can get to play that one. And so you can see quite a bit of a gait. You're gonna have to take my word for it, uh, but he did have a significant abnormality to his gait. He came back at his one week follow-up um, and he was kind enough to wear the same clothes. Uh, so you can say it's the same patient. Um, and we uh, took another quick cell phone video uh, of his gait, and he had a dramatic improvement in his gait at his one, you know, he say, I'm walking straighter is what his wife said, so I said, let's take some video. Uh, I was a little skeptical, um, and we'll see if the video really plays well, but go ahead and try. And it's a little sped up. I swear that I did not speed that up on purpose, but he was walking quicker uh, and without that gait. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, for the sake of time, we, we won't play it again, but we'll go on to the next uh, next panel. Thank you, everyone. That was excellent, though. We thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I learned so much about the biomechanics of the sacroiliac joint, especially about that middle third uh, section that could potentially be the culprit. As you know, I'm using the same technique as you, and I've seen some success in my patients, and I look forward to gathering some evidence on this stuff. So my question for you is, uh, now that we are sort of focusing on the middle third, uh, have you changed your technique to do the SI joint injections? Because just like you, I was going mostly caudal on my injections. Yeah, sometimes I will when I'm doing my diagnostic injections. I will try to see as it's almost kind of a test access to, to do a middle, middle SI joint injection just to see if, if, if accessing that joint's going to be hard. Uh, a lot of the times I won't. As we all know, even if you put a quarter or even a fourth of an ML of, of, of contrast into that SI joint, you see a beautiful line go all the way up to the superior aspect. So I think to get a true diagnostic injection, you can access it wherever you can get in. But sometimes I will do the joint injection in the middle part of the joint just for me to kind of plan my surgery. If I have a bear of a time, I go, this may be a tough surgical case. So let me, um, just, two, just two things. So there is a question bar tab for those of our colleagues who are with us. You can ask questions for the cows and I'll get to at the very end. Uh, Dawa, the, the other question I have for you, I want to make sure we understand the population here. So l 5 s one fusion is one group. Women who particularly had childbearing, uh, what other risk factors lead to SI joint disease? Yeah, I think, you know, L5-S1 fusion patients are really kind of the bread and butter. I, I think out of the, you know, the 50 that I've done, that's probably been about 60% of the patients. I think, you know, women are also another um, 
especially ones that have had multiple pregnancies, you know, a lot of the laxity and changes that could happen within the sacrum. But then patients with scoliosis, I've also found them to also, you know, especially if they have it on the contralateral or even the ipsilateral side of their curve. Those patients also have a high tendency to develop sacroiliac, uh, sacroiliac dysfunction. So I think those three have really been, at least in my practice, the biggest areas. When I see L5-S1 fusion, and these patients still have lower back pain. A lot of my stim patients, you know, these patients are doing really well, but then they come back and they still got this annoying pain and the stim rep is just going crazy trying to program them and cover sacroiliitis. What happens is that they stop using the stim for what it was working well for, which was their neuropathic pain and trying to cover their mechanical pain. And now they say their stim doesn't work again. We've really salvaged a lot of these patients uh, and we presented an abstract on that at NANS where we were able to place the link implant and just fuse, stabilize that, and magically their SI joints were, were, were stabilized and their uh, their their stems were working well again. Thanks. Yeah, I think you've shown you've shown the point that we have to treat multiple comorbidities in these patients, and we can do that all minimally in most cases. So I think it's a great uh, great area we're in. So Kaz, let's let's just transition to our next panel with uh, Dr. Tate and Dr. Azim. I'll let you introduce that panel, please. Sounds great. Thank you, Dalwood. So here's the topic that we all need help in, patient selection. This is something that uh, um, is up and coming, especially with sacroiliac joint dysfunction. So we have one of the biggest key opinion leaders in the country who are going to tell us about their own patient experience and the algorithms they use in order to be able to pick the right patient for the right procedure. Jordan Tate and Noman Azim, dear friends of mine, the floor is yours. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Cass. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us tonight. So as we all know, that with interventional procedures, appropriate patient selection is vital to optimize the outcomes of SI joint fusion. Uh, although diagnosing sacroiliac joint dysfunction and, and pain can be complex, it has been found that more than 22% of individuals who present with low back pain complaints actually may have problems with their SI joint. Uh, the prevalence of uh, SI joint pain and post lumbosacral fusion ranges between 43 and 61 percent, uh, as was mentioned. So it's very common. Uh, there may be up to a million patients annually with low back complaints that have SI joint dysfunction, and these patients may already be in your practice. So the patients may present with things such as low back pain, buttock pain, uh, hip and groin pain, low, lower extremity pain, uh, discomfort, discomfort while sitting, discomfort while sleeping, and then uh, as Dawood uh, and his video uh, uh, portrayed, uh, you can have abnormality in your gait. Having a selection algorithm may be appropriately, uh, may help appropriately identify these SI joint uh, patients. And we started this algorithm with taking an accurate and comprehensive history of a patient's musculoskeletal symptoms. It's crucial for making the correct diagnosis. And, and a lot of times this will help demonstrate multiple pain referral patterns. So you want to be able to differentiate. The impact of the symptoms can also affect a patient's functioning and, and must be assessed to really guide this therapy. Uh, this becomes specifically important in distinguishing SI joint pain from other sources of low back pain, such as uh, myofascial pain, facetogenic pain, discogenic pain, also hip pathology or things such as uh, piriformis syndrome. Uh, next slide, please. And generally, the physical examination begins when the patient is ambulating into the exam room with assessing the patient's posture, movement, and gait. Uh, provocative maneuvers can also elucidate the SI joint as a pain generator. Uh, individual sensitivity and specificity of some of these provocative uh, tests is poor individually, but several examination, examination techniques in, in conjunction uh, should increase, uh, should be able to increase your clinical suspicion. Uh, the diagnostic SI joint injections uh, again, are very reliable uh, technique to identify the SI joint as a source of pain. So conservative treatment can include medications such as uh, NSAIDs, physical therapy, SI joint injections, and ultimately SI joint fusion for refractory cases. Uh, although a typical pain pattern is difficult to describe, pain in the buttock near the region of the posterior superior iliac spine that radiates into the hip, thigh, or groin uh, has been described. However, there's no pathognomonic radi radiation pattern for the SI joint pain. Next slide, please. So elements in the history that may indicate SI joint involvement, we covered a few of these. Stephen did a great job of this, as well as Dawid. Uh, trauma, uh, postpartum, uh, a fall on the buttock or a fall uh, on your backside can do this. Uh, lumbar fusion, we've, we've discussed, scoliosis, uh, but also leg link prescriptancies and, and inflammatory arthritis. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So during your physical examination, you, you wanna make sure that you have a thorough general spine exam to again, rule out other potential sources of pain. Uh, the Ford and finger has commonly been utilized to diagnose SI joint pain uh, and really is not a provocative exam at all. It's just asking the patient to point um, to the area where it hurts. The provocative test put pressure on the SI joint to reproduce the pain. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Jordan to discuss specific provocative exams uh, and, and uh, Jordan, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Noman. Uh, next slide, please. So listed here are the provocative tests. Um, it's important to become familiar with the physical exam findings that are specific to diagnosing sacroiliitis. If you plan to perform an SI joint fusion, you want to be very confident that you are in fact treating SI joint pain. So listed here are, are five of the provocative tests that are most commonly utilized. Uh, the first is the FABERS, which actually stands for flexion, abduction, and external rotation, otherwise known as a figure four test. Um, it's important to perform this test and then ask the patient what symptoms they are having. Um, it is a, considered a positive test if they are getting reproduction of posterior sacroiliac pain um, after performing a FABER. The other tests, thigh thrust, Ganslin's test, compression and distraction um, are important uh, tests to really maximize your skills on. Um, it has been said that you need to document at least three of the five of these tests being positive. Um, one of these tests should be the thigh thrust or the compression. So you want to make sure that you understand how to perform these tests, especially on patients who have poor mobility and um, may require some uh, accommodations in order to best perform these tests in your clinic. Um, if you are able to confirm that at least three of these provocative tests are positive, you've really enhanced your sensitivity and specificity of your diagnosis. Um, it's been stated in a couple of different um, articles that the sensitivity can be as high as 91% if you are able to document uh, three of these provocative tests and the specificity is high as 78%. Um, so again, making sure you understand these physical exam skills um, implementing them on really all of your patients in which you suspect sacroiliitis, um, and then documenting at least three out of the five provocative tests. Next slide, please. A diagnostic injection um, is best performed under fluoroscopic guidance. Um, it has been looked at under ultrasound guidance and has yet to be validated. Um, at, so at this point, fluoroscopic contrast enhanced intraarticular injection of a low volume injectate is what is recommended. It is um, best if you can document that a patient has at least 75% pain relief or more. And this is going to be most likely um, that the patient is experiencing SI joint pain. Uh, a double confirmatory block is recommended and in many payer guidelines is required. Um, and overall, this may enhance your patient selection. Next slide. So once you have uh, the patients in your practice that you've identified that you believe have sacroiliitis based on their historical um, complaints, and um, understanding the patient population that they are in, be it the female patient, the female patient who's been pregnant, or somebody who has had a lumbosacral fusion specifically to the sacrum. Um, once you have those patients selected and you've performed your provocative exams and you've gone on to your diagnostic test, you've really identified some of the best candidates. So the best candidates are gonna be the ones that have the highest pretest prob probability of having SI joint pain. Um, somebody who you have been able to document that they have hypermobility or subluxations. And this might be something that you as a um, pain practitioner feel comfortable documenting, um, or it may be something that you need to rely on your physical therapist to assist you in uh, these maneuvers to better understand if somebody has a hypermobile SI joint. Um, of course, you want to offer this to patients who are motivated for pain relief and who are capable of understanding their post-surgical expectations. Um, any patient that is being considered for an advanced technique should be um, offered more conservative treatment therapies first, such as physical therapy, 
uh, bracing, uh, steroid injection, all of these are reasonable uh, workups to offer the, the patient the best um, candidacy. And overall, if the patient is still experiencing chronic pain and impaired function, impaired quality of life, this is going to um, isolate your best candidates for SI joint fusion. Next slide. So if you are interested in adding SI joint fusion into your practice and you're not really sure where to start, um, I think the best thing is to get the education and the discussion rolling with the patients um, by giving them the content. So if you have in your office the availability of models, posters, pamphlets in the waiting room, if you can direct them to your website where you can post videos, with educational content, you're going to be able to um, get more patients who are interested in pursuing SI joint fusion. Most of my patients I find are interested because it's minimally invasive. It involves a small incision outpatient with minimal sedation. So using these catchphrases can be helpful in um, talking to your patients about minimally invasive SI joint fusion. Something I do in my practice is hosting after hours seminars to invite patients. And when we have um, a specific um, procedure that we want to discuss, having a patient come and share their testimonial has always been the best way to get patients excited about exploring new emerging technologies. Next slide. Well, that so, was excellent. So Thank you, yeah. Jordan. Thank you, Noman. That was wonderful. Uh, I actually have a question for Noman. Uh, uh, Dal, we talked about how when patients have fusions, they uh, translate some of that axial pressure to the sacroiliac joint, and he's found that there are a lot of patients with failed back surgery syndrome who suffer from sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Do you find that patients who have had um, hip arthroplasties and knee arthroplasties with or without gates have the same issue as well? Absolutely. Um, so again, anything that's going to potentially affect the gait is going to put more stresses on that uh, sacroiliac joint, joint posteriorly. And it could be something as simple as just, you know, varying posture, but also, you know, the gait and getting up out of seats and, and going up and down steps. All of that is going to stress out that SI joint a lot more. So absolutely. Got it. So, Thank Dr. Zane, that's a great that's a great answer, Dr. Tay. I have a question for you, and that's about the diagnostic block. You know, I'm I'm always a little confused by three things, and so maybe you can help me here. One is, you know, can it be diagnostic and therapeutic? Uh, can I put local and have them keep a diary and add steroid, or does it have to be pure local? Uh, is a lateral branch block enough, or do I have to be intraarticular? And do I need an arthrogram? So uh, that's a lot of questions for you, but those are the questions that come up all the time in discussions with insurance companies and other colleagues. And those are those are three great questions. Um, so the first question, can it be both therapeutic and diagnostic and still count as a diagnostic block? And um, the answer is yes. And I think it it is possible to assist with the documentation um, with your patient by really parsing out how much relief did you get during the anesthetic phase? And then how much relief did you get ultimately down the road once the steroid was active and effective? Um, the second question you asked was about lateral branch blocks. And um, currently it is not considered um, to be uh, as effective as an intraarticular block. There's a, a study that showed that the, the lateral nerve blocks um, they did not believe were as um, diagnostic as an intraarticular. Um, so comparing between the two, the preference would be for the intraarticular diagnostic block. Um, and then, can you repeat the third question? Yeah, the last question was, do you, if you do two diagnostic blocks, do you have to do an arthrogram on both of those injections? Or if they're allergic to contrast, you do, you know, you don't do any arthrogram. How important is the arthrogram? Right, so I think um, obviously if somebody is allergic to contrast, you have a good reason not to perform the arthrogram. Um, I think it would be most helpful if you can do both an AP and a lateral projection to confirm intraarticular placement. Um, and in that case, it's really hard to argue that you were not inside the joint. Great, thank you both so much. That was a great discussion. So uh, we appreciate it. We'll see uh, if we have other questions at the end for you.
So Kaz, uh, you want to introduce Thank our next panel? Thank you so much, you too. So please stand by for the questions at the end. Now we're getting to the last section of our webinar. My two good friends, Yusuf Javis, Josephson and Pankaj Mehta, who between the two of them have a lot of experience with uh, secretary electron infusions. And we're gonna have a fireside chat with these guys about risks and complications. You know, because of your experience in the operating room, We'd love to know some of the do's and don'ts and learn from some of the pearls that you've picked up over the past few years. Tim, would you like to have the first question? Uh, absolutely. So Pankaj, I think one of the questions that really a lot of people are a little bit um, uh, confused about is how do you keep this uh, graft in place? You know, we, we know when you have a lateral approach by the surgeon with three large screws, it's going to stay in place. But when we do any of the methods we're discussing tonight, uh, are there, what's the secrets to avoiding the complication of a non-fusion? So um, that's a great question, Tim. I think, you know, I'd just like to add, first of all, you know, a great conversation, great interaction with the other speakers. I think, I think it is really important for all the interventional pain physicians on the call, on the webinar, to understand that this is really an evolution. I think we've moved really from a lateral approach to a posterior approach. And, and that's that's the new thing. That's the next generation SI fusion technique. And uh, one of the things I'll say is that, you know, we, we make sure that once we have installed the graph, um, deployed the graph rather, um, to actually have some, uh, make sure that we actually give the patients certain restrictions. And so usually we try to kind of make it pretty standard because, um, you know, I've said it before, about 20% of our practice is implantable therapies and kind of makes it easy in my ASC for the nurses to follow the same protocol as SCS and other implantable therapies. So, we, you know, no bending, lifting, anything for six weeks. We make sure that the patient doesn't um, go back and start their NSAIDs straight away. And, um, and one of the things we make sure that, you know, we follow this patient up for at least a dressing change or um, wound check uh, within 10 days. And, and make sure that we kind of reinforce these activities. Um, so that's really the key, you know, um, to make sure that once, once this fusion is kind of like, has it been accepted as part of the deployment of the implant, um, these patients then start to kind of like feel better. Great, great. Kaz? If, if I could add excellent. to that. Thank you. Oh yes, please. No, if I got you. So I also uh, uh, add a, uh, an SI joint belt um, for patients also uh, that I have them wear for uh, for the first month or so after the implant, I think that that helps with this, with also providing some stability to the to the joint and for the patient as well. They usually appreciate that, um, and I find that the the adherence to it is pretty good as well. So. Oh, great, great, great that's, that's insight, uh, great advice, absolutely. Kaz, very good, Pearl. Yeah, so I'm wondering about anticoagulants. As you know, we stuff anticoagulants for most of the implantable technologies that we do because we're all afraid of bleeding uh, inside the spine and even in that area. So I wanna know how you guys manage anticoagulants and bleeding in these patients. Joe, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, so again, also to kind of echo uh, Pankaj, thanks for having me. And uh, this is a really important conversation that, that we're having here. Um, so I, I, I treat this also like any of the other implantable therapies that we utilize. Um, so I, I will have patients uh, stop their anticoagulation Consistent with uh, with the guidelines that uh, that are present for uh, SCS and others, um, I I've been kind of more like, lax on aspirin. Um, I do allow patients to continue uh, low dose aspirin, um, and uh, but for the most part, I really just follow the same guidelines as a uh, you know for any implantable therapy. What if you have bleeding inside the wound itself as you're doing the procedure? How are you handling that? So again, the uh, the wound is a, a fairly deep wound. So um, if I have bleeding that I can't stop, um, which again really is fairly rare, uh, I will put like a surgicel in there. Uh, put a surgicel with uh, usually will help stop the bleeding pretty quickly, um, and then you can kind of have that peace of mind. Uh, I find with these posterior techniques that uh, you know that that bleeding really doesn't seem to be much of an issue overall. Um, you know, I actually was uh, I. I my background is as, as, a, as an osteopath and then as a PM&R doc, I was always interested in the SI joint. And uh, I actually took the, um, the SI bone course that we were never allowed to do it, which was always kind of a bother to me. I always wondered why I couldn't do it, but they did allow some pain docs to go and take the course. And when I took the course, uh, it was immediate and looking at that, that there was probably a risk for tremendous bleeding with that lateral approach. But what I found with the posterior approach is that we've utilized, especially with this without drilling, 
that the uh, the amount of bleeding that you get is minimal, if any. So if there is some bleeding, um, I do use a you know use something like uh, like cell stuff, which yeah, I, I, I agree with. Sure, uh, sure. I agree with Joe. I think I think really the most oozing. I, I would use the word oozing. I see. Yeah. Is skin, skin edges. You know, you always want to keep a bovie ready. This is a this is a implantable therapy. You want to do it <laughs> with some uh, bovie um, setup ready. So, uh, but the most bleeding I've seen is really just from the skin edges and just a couple of buzzes. So, Pankaj, let me jump in here for a second, uh, and I have a comment that I want to ask you both. <laughs> the comment is, one of the reasons that we have found that interventionists are really the perfect people to do the posterior approach is, is because we're not near the sciatic nerve. We're not near major vessels. I mean, this is a much safer procedure, and I, and I really think we need to look closely. Do we really need to even discontinue anticoagulants? We need to study that. Because I've found in a lot of areas we don't, but probably we do, but we really haven't studied that very well in the sicker, older patient population. My other question, though, involves infection, and I'll be interested to hear both your perspectives on this and try to pan caution. There's really two issues here. One is if you put a graft in and it gets infected, that would be somewhat of a mess. And so how would you handle that? What would your precautions be? And how would you treat that? Secondly, and I'll, I'll give that first part to Pankaj and then Joe, what about the, the, the graft itself? How do they test to make sure the graft donor uh, is safe from an infectious standpoint? So, uh, uh, and then Cass can ask, ask a follow-up after that. Yeah, um, Tim, I think, I think this, is a, this, is, this was always a kind of a debate in my mind and this is not a, like a hardware implantable therapy like we're used to in other, other parts of our other implantable therapies we do in our space. And so one of the protocol or algorithm which I was following in my practice was to basically do a, a skip protocol or an OR protocol of a perioperative antibiotic, and that was it. I, I never used any postoperative antibiotic. Um, we, we try to standardize all implantable therapies for infection, like you know, hip cleanse wash and you know, nasal mesoprosin, and um, you know, keep be very vigilant about any other things such as you know, uncontrolled diabetes double gloving and, and usually try to follow the same, you know, the NAC guidelines as for any other implantable therapy. Um, and, and fingers crossed, I've not yet had an infection for a posterior approach SI joint implant uh, or a fusion or stabilization device. But it, it's, it's always the question in mind. So I think right now my algorithm is that we don't really give postoperative antibiotics. I do give perioperative antibiotics and, and be very, very vigilant, especially if there's any high risk uh, factors, uh, patient factors. Excellent. Joe? So uh, to kind of piggyback on that, so, you know, the, the, the safety of the donor allograft is, is, a, is, is something that is of vital importance. You need to know that if you are going to be receiving an allograft, that every single measure has been taken to ensure that that graft is, uh, is safe and that, um, that there's minimal and, and no risk of, of transmission of diseases. So to prevent that, the allograft uh, implant has undergone several levels of uh, serology testing that is performed, which includes HIV testing, hepatitis C, and there's a, a, whole, uh, a whole panel of tests that are done. And again, this is in compliance with the US FDA and in accordance with the AATB uh, and applicable, applicable state guidelines as well. Uh, so, and again, the donors, they're carefully screened and, um, and their autopsy results are, if possible, are, 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 um, are evaluated and all medical records are evaluated as well to ensure that the allograft is, is safe um, and that the uh, that the person that the whoever's receiving it has the uh, has the confidence to know that it is safe. So I want to move into what I call rapid fire now. You're going to be the first two victims of the rapid fire. We have 12 minutes left in the webinar. 12 minutes exactly for uh, you know several hundred people have stayed on with us. So I think it's uh, important. Kaz will ask you both one question. You have one minute to answer the question, and then we'll we'll call call it into this panel, and we'll go back and ask the other panelists one question apiece. So. Has That's one right. question, one minute. Sounds good. In fact, I have, we have a series of questions here from the audience. We should ask all the panel to turn on their microphones. I know not everybody can get on camera because of the video limitation. But here's a rapid fire question for the two of you. What kind of anesthesia do you use for this for these procedures? I do a deep max sedation. Same. I do a deep max sedation. Excellent. Yep. So the next question is, and this is something that uh, all of you can answer, is drilling an issue uh, with, uh, with elevated temperature? How about a handheld drill? Maybe Dr. Falowski can answer that question for us. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And uh, 
it looks like the webcam limit was reached. So uh, I'll just answer from <laughs> without an image. Uh, the, the likelihood of any kind of temperature increase on cortical bone uh, is, is highly unlikely. I mean, you're talking about a very small discrepancy in, in temperature uh, changes, especially with the degree or amount of drilling that you would do with placement of a graft or like an inner body piece like this. Now that would be a little bit different when surgeons place uh, titanium screws because not only are we drilling a pathway or uh, and priming it for the titanium screw, but then we drill a titanium screw as well. So you may have a slight elevation there, but even that is uh, for the most part inconsequential. Excellent. Tim, do you have any uh, questions about that, about the drill at all or not? Yeah, I think there's a, well, not only about the drill, that's a decision each doctor can make on their own based on the evidence. But I think my other question, I'll go back to, to Dawood. Dawood, there's several shapes of graphs. There's a, there's hardware, you know, you heard Joe mention a while ago, this, this is an allograph versus hardware. So the question I have for Dawood is, is there any physiological differences between those graph types? What, what's, what's, how do we decide what to do? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that I look at now when you look at these graphs and on, on the surface, a lot of them look almost exactly the same. Uh, I think a concept that we're going to start to hear as a buzzword is the graph window. So again, that's the opening within the graph that you're going to place. So when, you know, there's two parts of the graph, you know, there's the cortical bone, which is the graph itself. But then we also kind of coat this graph in EDM putty, which is uh, another type of you know, uh, grafting material. So when you have a big graft window, you can really fill that implant up with that DBM putty. So then you, in my mind, the fusion where you want it to occur around the graft will, will, will be a much more superior fusion to say something that has a small opening in it, you can't get much DBM putty in there. Or say for instance, you put the, the graft in and you just put a sponge anterior to the graft potentially not much fusion could occur around the graft itself. So I think graft window is gonna be a buzzword that's gonna become more and more important. So I think I encourage everyone to kind of look at these implants and not just take them as all being the same. I wanna want ask Jordan Tate the next question. I wanna ask Jordan about, about osteoporosis. So Jordan, when you when you see these patients, you know, and uh, you know, no, I know Noman and you talked about selection, so I'll come to Noman next with a follow-up question because we're, we're gonna get these uh, rapid fires in, but how much is too much osteoporosis? When can I put a graft in someone? I have a 75 year old patient scheduled next week. Um, how do I, how do I make sure she's safe? I think it's an excellent question. It's something that I um, also look at with my patients and um, anybody who has osteopenia, I think is, you know, clear anybody with osteoporosis, especially if they've had a history of any sort of sacral insufficiency fracture or compression fracture, I definitely give some pause. And, and Noman, do you agree with that? Do you have any other thoughts? I, I do agree with that. Now with osteopenia though, because of the fact that we're not talking about a metal hardware device that's being implanted, it is a bone graft. Uh, I think that I'd be a little bit more lenient with osteopenia. But just like Jordan said, if there's been a history of any kind of insuffic insufficiency fractures or compression fracture, I think that would make me pause. Yes. Excellent. Yes. So I'm reading through the questions that the audience are asking. So Jordan, this question is the, the best suited for you. Can the aside joint be painful but not unstable? And if so, is there a particular test out of all the tests that you mentioned that you would use to be able to see it? So Kaz, um, I can answer this also because of personal experience as somebody who's been pregnant several times, I have had SI joint um, pain and I don't believe that I have any SI joint instability. However, um, I have performed some of these tests on myself and I personally will tell you that between the, um, the Fabers and the Ganslins, I think both of them are the most um, sensitive tests at picking up SI joint pain. Excellent. Thank that's you a, so a, much. That's a great, great answer. I have a question for Stephen. So Stephen, let's say we train someone, but they kind of suck. They're terrible, and they put the they put the graft in the bone in the sacrum, not in the joint. Uh, how dangerous is that? Uh, what do we do to fix it? And uh, how common so, is it? Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, the truth of the matter is, for, for the most part, it's uh, it's not that dangerous. I mean, you're putting a graft into bone. Obviously, it's not going to be effective, though. Um, that's one of the nice things about these approaches is that they are not dangerous approaches, and it's actually 
uh, I would hate to say it this way, but it's very hard to hurt somebody with these uh, approaches. Uh, so uh, obviously you'll have a poor outcome, the patient will have pain from it. What you can do in that situation, if that is what occurs, uh, you can look to actually place the graft into the right location. Um, you're, you're basically not gonna go after that other graft, you would just leave it there, uh, but then you would make an attempt to place the graft in a new location. Um, if you can't do that because there's too much overlap, overlap of where that graft is, you'd have to go through a, a surgical revision, which would be something like putting the titanium screws across the joint. Very good. Thank right. you. Uh, my next question is for Dawood. Dawood, um, how long, this is actually from my dear friend, Dr. Mohajar in Las Vegas, and he's asking how long does a typical procedure take for an SI joint fusion? So um, sitting on the CPT panel for the AMA, I uh, politically, I will not say exactly how long this procedure will take. I think this is on par with many of the implanted procedures we, we take. I think, you know, with the technique that I use with one implant and one grafted is very predictable. I think there's really, uh, once you get used to the procedure, you will do it almost exactly the same. There's not a lot of other variables. So I, I find that I can really, when I schedule these cases, I know exactly based on my skill set how long the procedure is going to take, and there's not a lot of variables. Uh, I really don't like to get into the, how long a procedure could take, because right now we do have you know favorable reimbursement for this procedure, and once people start bragging about this thing taking them four minutes to put in, um, we may have some consequences. That we flip up that. You, you know, Excellent. I find that uh, these procedures have a way of humbling you, Dawood, as, as you and I both know. We, we get a little confident, you think the procedure is going to be very quick, and then you get the case that looks easy, but takes you two hours. So I think that, that that'll be variable on the patient and the physician and the method. So I think that we really don't know how long it would take anybody on this uh, on this uh, webinar to know. We have we have four minutes left, Kaz. So I'm gonna ask Pankaj one more question then give you the last question, okay? Pankaj, the, the question I have for you is, uh, you know, we know there's a code for this procedure and there's reimbursement available. What about PRP and prolotherapy and things like that that really don't have Many, many areas reimbursement. Do you try that first or do you go right to this because there's better outcome data based on the SI bone work? What, what, what do you do first? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because you know um, I really had physicians asking me this. Everybody has their own algorithms, but I think based on evidence and based on both anecdotal and as well as um, um, you know uh, real evidence out there for SI um, bone and SI joint stabilization techniques, one of the things we changed in our practice, Tim, for uh, design new algorithms is when somebody walks in with uh, where we suspect SI joint pain and is positive for um, with provocative measures, um, we basically go in straight for a diagnostic SI joint injection and move straight to an SI joint stabilization technique to the posterior approach. And I think I think that is really key because really there's no point wasting time. Um, doing other things like prolotherapy and stuff. Now, you know, again, this is just my personal opinion, and and I'm sure there are physicians out there who who maybe have some anecdotal um, evidence where patients have done well. But clearly, all of us, we, we we do this day in day out. We do so many of these stabilization techniques, and all of these patients do well with this. So I think it's time for all of us to tweak our algorithms. I, I agree, Kaz. Any other one last I question wanna, before I, we close? I, I actually saved the last question for you, Tim. You know, so mm -hmm. you have been uh, one of the pioneers in bringing a, a plethora of evidence for various uh, modalities that we use in pain management. SI Bone has uh, simply started this whole process with sacroiliac joint fusion, and there's a lot of good evidence for the, for the lateral approach. What would you like us to do in terms of gathering evidence for the posterior approach in the near and long-term future? Well, Kaz, I love this question and I'll answer it, then I'll have you close the webinar. So, you know, what really frustrates me sometimes is that sometimes we do a poor job. And so uh, you mentioned SI Bone, Medtronic also has a lateral fusion device and Steven mentioned some of those. And they've done some studies that, that led to their approval, uh, particularly SI Bone. Uh, now it's time for us to do prospective studies uh, that are in multiple centers. So we see that it works in different people's hands uh, in a prospective fashion, looking at safety and efficacy, not just because you know we wanna find out if it works or not, but also who does it work in? Who's a good candidate for this? We heard from both uh, Noman and Jordan, great things on selection. Stephen talked about the, the methods, but I do think the studies are needed and we don't need a huge number of patients, You know, 200 patient prospective randomized study. And I also wanna look at what about combined therapies? What about SI fusion and SI 
and, and interest bound of spacers and or mild or or you know simulation. What about we mix these minimally invasive things together? So there's so much work needed. And as you know, I'm trying to design now a multi-center radio frequency ablation study for lumbar spine that still hasn't been done yet in the way it needs to be done. So the short answer is right now the evidence for this procedure is good, but very antidotal. And we really need prospective randomized study. So I encourage those of you on this webinar tonight, uh, most of whom have stayed with us throughout the entire time, to join together, uh, get a protocol approved, and then go forward with the study. So I think that's going to be a, the future of the field. The good news is, since it's approved in patient need criteria, it can be done in the setting of an insurance approval with a proper um, investigational approval from your institution. So I think we can do this together, Cass. Absolutely. I love that answer. And I love the fact that you brought up that a lot of our patients do have multimodal pain generators in their lower back in those areas. And we all have to be cognizant of that. So uh, with that, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. I want to thank all the faculty for joining us. You guys did a phenomenal job. Please don't forget about our meeting um, uh, on September 17th for the Think Tank and also the annual meeting for Aspen that's happening in the same hotel in Miami from September 18th to September 20th. And we, we also have a cadaver course on September 20th for the young guns and the fellows who may be interested in joining us. And of course, we're gonna do sacral electron fusion demonstrations at that as well. Next slide, please. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Pain Tech who uh, got us all together for us to be able to learn from each other and learn from the pearls from the experience of all these physicians. Tim, thank you so much for letting me join you on, as a moderator on this uh, webinar. This was excellent. I'd like to wish everybody a good night. Thank you, Kaz, and good night, everyone. God bless, and we'll see you uh, next week. Bye-bye.